Yo, what's going on YouTube? What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel, man. Thank you for tuning in. We're going to be checking out top 10 real haunting cases in history, scarier than Insidious. Now, I don't know all of the Insidious movies, but we just did watch the latest movie. I think it was called Red Door. Uh, pretty good, actually. I enjoyed it. Let me know what you guys thought about it, if you saw it, and what you think about the Insidious as a whole. But one thing is, me and my wife, and even my kids, we like watching some scary movies. So uh, I'm excited to see what this is with the real haunting cases in history that are scarier than Insidious. Let's go ahead and dive into this one, see what they're talking about. Insidious is one of many horror movie franchises that surrounds the complete an utterly terrifying scenario of demonic possession. Now, as scary as these movies might be, when you're watching them, you can always reassure yourself that it's not real to help lower that heart rate. But yeah. what about when it is real life. Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. My name is Kennedy and today we are going to be counting down some of the most terrifying hauntings to ever occur. Grab some holy water and stay away from those Ouija boards because these are the top 10 real haunting cases in history, scarier than insidious. Starting us off at number 10 is Michael Taylor. Back in 1974, a beloved and cheerful family man without any previous criminal history seemed to suddenly change overnight into a different person. The previously non-religious man joined a local church and quickly became entangled with 21-year-old preacher Marie Robinson, who convinced her congregation that the power of God could drive out their demons. However, strangely, the more Taylor became involved with Robinson and the church, the more he changed. The once kind and patient man was turning irritated and foul-mouthed, and it all came to a head when he and the preacher were found naked together. This kind of behavior was apparently so out of character for Michael that the church decided to exorcise him, believing he was possessed. They strapped him down and allegedly exorcised a whopping 40 demons from his body. But what? it would turn out that it wasn't enough, as still three demons remained inside. That night, Michael brutally killed and dismembered his wife and dog, and upon being arrested, told oh police that God. he was possessed by Satan who compelled him to destroy everything living within his house. Deemed unfit for trial, Taylor was ultimately sent to a psychiatric facility, but it seems like those last three demons remained attached to the man for the rest of his life. Moving on to number nine. Oh, I wish they would have told us uh, what happened with him the rest of his life. Did he end up dying in the insane asylum? Man, that is a loaded story as well. So, wow. Ended up dismember killing and dismembering his wife. Uh, what happened to the preacher, right? I mean, th he was involved in a preacher. I guess that was like a affair or something. Um, man. Okay. Nine, Clara Germana Seeley. In 1906, a South African girl began terrifying her family after one fateful night where she was allegedly possessed by a demonic entity. Now, no one knows exactly what happened that night, but the next day she began to exhibit superhuman strength, allegedly throwing nuns around the room with a simple flick of her wrist while making inhuman noises. Terrifyingly, Clara would also speak in language languages she was not known to have any knowledge of. But after a two-day exorcism where she floated several feet in the air and attempted to strangle the priest, she was finally freed from the demon. Let's just hope that the demon died and didn't get passed along to anyone else. Next up- One thing, uh, we've watched, once again, some movies lately with, uh, Possession. I don't remember the name of them. Russell Crowe was in one of them and then, like, uh, Pray for the Devil was another one. One thing that commonly happens in these movies is crawling up the walls, right? When somebody's possessed, they can crawl up a wall, up to a ceiling. I always think that's interesting. Like, why is that the go-to, right? Walking backwards. But I guess they, they're just trying to showcase how a person exhibits supernatural type um, behavior when they're possessed. So let me know, Do y'all have y'all ever heard of anyone or known of anyone in your families, fam distant friends that you believe we're possessed at some point. I know my wife has a story that I thought was kind of interesting, uh, but she doesn't like sharing too many details on that. So I, I think when people are close to something like that, it probably hits them pretty hard, almost like a traumatic thing. At number eight, 
Robbie Mannheim. Interestingly, the case of Robbie Mannheim, which is an alias, was actually the real life inspiration for The Exorcist. In the 1930s, oh, really? when Robbie was just 13 years old, he decided he wanted to contact his deceased aunt. However, being so young, he made two very bad decisions. Number one, he did so in the middle of the night when the veil between worlds is easier for dark spirits to pass through. And number two, he used a Ouija board. Now, not long after his 3 a.m. seance, strange things started happening to Robbie. Furniture would dart across the house, religious art on the walls would vibrate or fall when he walked by, and classmates even reported his desk flying across the room. Priests eventually agreed to perform an exorcism on the boy, but the demon was not so keen to leave. Allegedly, he attacked the priests with superhuman strength when they tried to free him of the spirit. But thankfully, the priests won this one, and the demon was expelled next up I man i remember that movie traumatized me as a kid the exorcist the version they were talking about uh, with the little girl oh my god her face was scarred in my memory for years i'm talking like a decade i would see her face when i would like shut off the closet light or turn off the, the restroom light man i would just see that face it actually like scarred me I'm, I'm good now i'm good now but man that thing messed me up for a long time um it's it's interesting they brought up the religious art shaking and falling off the wall because i had a similar situation happen when i was younger and that freaking that freaked me out um you know that that painting ended up coming down the wall and i went back to the back room and it was wound up pretty far away from where it was hung almost like it was flung off the wall and a lot of bad stuff happened in our house growing up so uh i know that pretty frequently um they would talk about there being you know, loosely demons in our house, demons in our house, but uh, yeah, that was a little freaky when that happened. At number seven, Julia. In 2008, Dr. Richard Gallagher, a psychiatrist and professor at the New York Medical College, revealed a haunting case of demonic possession. It is a little unusual for a medical professional to be the backer, as usually they are prone to associate the symptoms with mental health disorders. but. Julia was a special case. Dr. Gallagher said she would change her voice drastically out of nowhere from a high-pitched squeal to a Ooh, deep manly face. guttural sound. She was known to speak in tongues and reveal personal knowledge about others in the room that had never been divulged to her. Often she would levitate yeah. off the ground and was even able to throw objects across the room with her mind. Eventually, at a loss for what to do, Dr. Gallagher attempted calling in a priest to perform an exorcism. But this made matters easier even worse, as it clearly bothered the entity possessing Julia. Allegedly, during the attempted exorcism, the demon said they would be sorry for their actions to try and get rid of it. Apparently, Julia continues to display signs of possession to this day and terrifies all that try to fix her condition. Whoa. Moving on to number six. Oh, that's even that's even scarier uh, that she's still exhibiting signs of that. But that that's one thing that I've also seen in the exorcism movies, and I guess that's where it comes from. Is they they say that they know deep personal knowledge of you that others wouldn't know, and that you wouldn't share some of your deepest, darkest, you know, embarrassing moments or shameful moments. They would know those things, and they'll speak them to you to to let you know, like, hey, there's something more than a, a human here right this isn't a human soul anymore talking to you man that would be wild annalise michael a truly tragic story from 1975 annalise michael is one of the most well-known stories of demonic possession to this it day. might be due to the movie on this a one i don't know christian but strangely one day when she was 16 she passed out and when she woke, she was never the same again. Originally diagnosed with epilepsy and depression after a series of terrifying convulsive episodes, Annalise believed she was possessed, and so her family began looking for alternate methods to heal her, along with encouraging her to stop taking her medication. After a long search and many turning oh, them away, yep. they found two priests who agreed to perform exorcisms on her, and in fact ended up performing a whopping 67 sessions over 10 months. During oh. one exorcism, a demon allegedly spoke through Annalise, saying, people are stupid as pigs. They think it's all over after death. It goes on. As the months went by, she stopped eating as the demons instructed her and eventually died of malnutrition. In the end, the involved priests were convicted with manslaughter and condemned for encouraging the young woman to stop her medication. Even so, the case of Annalise Michael has remained one of the most horrifying cases to date.
Now, 100%, I believe that some of these things that go on is a mental illness that is either misdiagnosed or not sought doctor's involvement and just taken to the church, right? That I do believe happens, and that very well may have been the case with Annalise. Um, but do you guys believe that there are actual true demonic possessions that happen in this world? I'm interested to hear what you think. Uh, man, I don't have the knowledge on that. I don't have the experience. I don't. I haven't been exposed to things like that in my life. But um, it's not outside of question for me. I, I think. I think it's possible. Moving on to number five, the Smurl family. In 1974, the Smurl family moved with excitement to a new home in West Pittston, Pennsylvania. But little did they know they were about to enter the worst 12 years of their life. The first inkling that something was gravely wrong happened when their home renovations were found destroyed. Their new wallpaper was peeled from the walls, freshly painted windows were cracked. But to top it off, a strange odor filled every room and disturbing voices were heard throughout the house. From there, things escalated and the demon began hurting the family members, reportedly throwing the dog and one of the daughters down the stairs on separate occasions as well as routinely committing SA on female members oh, of the family damn. in the night. Eventually, turmoil got so bad by 1986 that the Smurls contacted Ed and Lorraine Warren for help. Upon the investigators' arrival, Lorraine believed that the home was infested with four spirits. A harmless elderly woman, an old man who had died at the house, a young and violent girl, and a demon that controlled the other spirits and had turned them against the family. Thankfully, the incident Incidents stopped by October 1986, but still the family hightailed it out of there and moved back to Wilkes Bar. Coming yeah. in at number So that was that the case that that movie The Conjuring was based off of? Uh, I saw that movie and wow, was that movie wild, dude. One of the scariest movies I had seen in a long time. For the Armstrong Street House. In 1970, a couple named Anne and Roger Brock moved their family into a beautiful four-bedroom house in Kokomo, Indiana. The family didn't have a ton of money, but they were able to score the house for just five grand, which, in hindsight, could have been a clue. Mere hours after the family moved in, they began to experience strange things. Hours. Lights were flickering and noises were appearing, but they brushed it off as nothing. Then one night, one of their daughters, Lana, was awoken by sudden shaking all around her bed. She thought it was an earthquake at first, but then she looked out her window to see a strange man, seemingly drenched, standing right beside her bedroom window staring at her. Lana freaked out, but then as quickly as he appeared, he was gone. This became routine for poor Lana, and demons started haunting her every night. One night, she heard a knock at her door, and assuming it was her parents, she went to answer it, only to have her mouth covered by an invisible hand. She tried to scream, but the hand wouldn't let her. Suddenly, her dog appeared and distracted the entity, allowing Lana to scream for help, but this only angered the spirit. To get back at her, it picked up the dog and threw it out the window, sending it Damn. plunging to its demise. Years later, they learned that someone was killed in the house, which could explain their haunting, but still not a single family member has ever dared to return. Moving yeah. on to number three. Yeah, I'm moving out as soon as that stuff starts happening. Now, I live in a brand new built house. This home was built for us. We are the first family to live here. Let me know, do you guys think it's possible that this house could be haunted, okay? Um, do you think if things happened on these grounds, prior to us having this home built, that those spirits would be here? Let me know what you think on that. I think no, I haven't had any reason to believe so, uh, but I remember when we first moved in, our kids were scared that things were happening. Haven't really heard so much about that anymore. I think it just has to do with the age in a new house. Sometimes you're scared of that, but. Three, the house of death. Once the home of actress and poet Jan Bryant Bartel in the 60s, this house holds a reputation for housing some of the most demonic entities in all of New York City. Within weeks of moving in, Jan knew something was deeply wrong with the house. She would often feel the touch of an icy hand across the back of her neck or hear footsteps follow her around the empty house. The house always reeked like something was rotten or dying, Ooh. and her dogs were always barking into nothingness. Then yeah. one day, one of her That's dogs sign, right? died out 
out of nowhere. So she decided to take matters into her own hands and called a psychic medium. But this only angered the demons living inside. During the first session, the medium went into an unusual trance, speaking about the hundreds of bodies buried underneath the house. Jan knew it wasn't the medium speaking, and it was then that she learned how many people had been killed or taken their own lives while living here. Then all of a sudden, the medium's eyes bulged out of her head and she started shouting that she would never leave in a deep demonic voice. This wow. encounter was enough for Jan to leave and never return. But sadly, a few years later, after publishing a book about her life Don't in the haunted me. house, she took her own life. Damn. Moving on to number two. Damn. Damn. When you take your own life after ex having those kind of experiences, you got to think how many people don't believe you, maybe. But I think when you take your life, I mean, dude, those, she was haunted by something. She was haunted by something, whether you believed her or not. Um, why, why does it seem like these demons will always, like, kill pets, though? Like, that's a common theme, too, in a lot of these stories, that their dog ends up dead with, like, a, a broken neck or a cat. Or it's always, you know, pets. Are they easier for these demons to target and harm than a person? The Haunting of Esther Cox. In 1878, in Nova Scotia, Canada, a young woman named Esther Cox was violently assaulted by a male friend and left that encounter never the same again. Not only was this woman reeling from the real life harm and metaphorical demons to overcome, but yeah. soon enough, another demon began to make itself known too. One night, Esther's body began to swell as she alternated between high fevers and shivering icy lows. And after objects in the house began to fly around, her family worried something worse than a fever was around. For good measure, a doctor was called, but allegedly when he arrived, he saw the words, Esther Cox, you are mine to kill appear on the wall at the end of her bed. Once Esther had a semblance of energy, she tried to move, but she quickly discovered the demon was not attached to the house, it was attached to her, and was following her no matter where she went. Among the demon's tactics were the setting of small fires, one of which burned down Cox's host's farmhouse and resulted in her serving jail time for arson. Eventually, attempts to communicate wow. with the spirit through seance and spirit wrapping revealed that there were at least five different ghosts following Cox around for unknown reasons. And last up in our number. That, that's one more thing I noticed is that it's usually multiple demons. I wonder if there's multiple deaths happen, happening there, uh, whether by murder, suicide, natural. If the more that happen, the stronger their presence is able to be felt. You know what I'm saying? If it's just one, well, maybe it takes multiple in that same area for that energy to kind of as they say push through the veil let me know you think you guys think there's something to that or you think it's all just a crock <laughs> number one spot maria jose ferreira in 1965 brazil a young girl by the name of maria jose ferreira tragically became the target of a malicious poltergeist in the beginning the angry spirit would manifest stones and bricks out of nowhere and target maria with various attacks these included scratches slaps and bites which often left her battered and bruised she was confused and her family couldn't understand understand what was happening to her or why this demon had chosen her as a target. So they decided to call upon an exorcist to see if they could free their sweet girl from the demon's grasp. But sadly, a visit by an exorcist did little to help, but instead provoked the spirit even further, to the point where it was setting Maria on fire in public places, in Damn. full view of many witnesses unconnected to the case. Now at a loss for where to turn, the family brought their daughter to a medium for answers, and it was here the medium claimed that Maria had apparently been a witch in a previous life and was now being tormented by the spirits her previous incarnation had sent to their deaths with black magic the poltergeist being one of them that is, the medium that's quite a claim implored the spirits to leave the innocent girl alone but it didn't work and after years of torment maria took her own life to escape her living hell well oh. that's all i got for you today my friends i hope you liked this video and make sure to leave a comment down below of any other terror well, guys, if you guys don't mind sharing with me, let me know if y'all have any stories that you'd like to tell me. I love hearing a good scary story. Um, you know, so let me know if you've got any family related stories or some experiences that you've had with your own with hauntings, possessions that you've known of people to experience or that you've heard of others experiencing.
would appreciate reading those, man. Thank you for sticking through the video. If you enjoyed this, please let me know by leaving a like, subscribing. I appreciate it very much, and I'll catch you on the next one. All right, peace.